Hey folks and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to talk about the different kinds of surgical hemorrhage. Now any surgery involves a degree of bloodletting whether it be a minor mole removal from the back or major pelvic, abdominal or vascular trauma. In this video we're going to talk about the different kinds of surgical hemorrhage what to do about them, how to assess them, how to prevent them, how to treat them. It's also important not to confuse the topic of surgical hemorrhage with the topic of shock, which is a different process and it's about uh, perfusing vital organs. So it's important not to confuse the two issues. Now there are three kinds of surgical hemorrhage and they're divided into primary, reactionary and secondary. And the best way to think about this is in terms of time scale. So your primary hemorrhage is immediate, reactionary hemorrhage is within a few hours and secondary hemorrhage is within a few days. Let's start with primary hemorrhage. Primary hemorrhage is when you cut tissue. Anytime you cut any form of tissue, any laceration, it bleeds and that's immediate. It's usually arterial but it can also be venous or capillary. There's very little anybody can do about that but what you can do is when you get bleeding you can stop it by just applying simple pressure. Another way to stop immediate primary hemorrhage is use of intense heat and this is called diathermy in surgical language and that can be in the form of a bipolar diathermy or a monopolar diathermy. Now obviously it is very important that at the end of an operation all bleeding has been controlled and it's a surgical convention that you don't let the patient off the table until all the bleeding is fully under control. If there is any doubt, you can uh, leave a drain, in, uh, particularly in a cavity, for example, in the abdomen or in the neck, where a potential risk of bleeding and causing a hematoma can be quite catastrophic because of pressure on the airway. Now let's talk about reactionary bleeding, and this is not immediate, but usually within a few hours. And reactionary bleeding is usually in response to a rise in blood pressure. Reactionary bleeding is usually venous but it can also be arterial. It's common for the patient when they wake up from an anesthetic for a degree of pain and anxiety to raise their blood pressure and this will lead to reactionary bleeding, a reaction to raise blood pressure. It's also possible that you know for example the patient's circulating volume has been restored and that can lead to reactionary bleeding. This kind of bleeding is usually from an unsecured blood vessel. So for example, if a suture hasn't you know, kind of been properly done or if a tie comes off or if all the little blood vessels haven't been adequately secured using intense heat diathermy, then when the blood pressure goes up and reaction to that, these blood vessels pop open and there's bleeding. Now it is important to have a system in your own head of how to prevent and how to treat how to deal with reactionary bleeding. And the best way to think about this is in terms of systemic measures and local measures. Systemic measures would be things like the anesthetic measures, for example, control of blood pressure and uh, control of pain. And you can give the patient local anesthetic immediately before the patient wakes up because postoperative pain is usually a common cause of reactionary bleeding. You can also give the patient tranexamic acid. Local measures to prevent a reactionary bleeding would be things like making sure that all the ties and all the sutures are adequate and are in place and they're not going to come off. Another thing would be to uh, secure all the little blood vessels that uh, can't be tied off or can't be sutured, make sure that they are coagulated with bipolar diathermy. Now let's talk about secondary bleeding. Now we've talked about primary which is immediate, reactionary which is within a few hours and secondary is within a few days and the commonest reason for secondary bleeding is infection. So what happens is that you get a local inflammation and infection in the wound and that leads to the dissolution of the clot, disintegration of the clot and exposure of the sort of raw surfaces and any blood vessels that haven't been secured or were secured and now have been exposed basically start to bleed. And again the best way to deal with this is to prevent it. Now you can give antibiotics prophylactically in terms of prevention or you can give them therapeutically when, when there is some sort of infection setting in. And there are some local measures so for example you know wound hygiene making sure that the stitches are taken out in you know, reasonable time and just making sure that the patient knows how to look after the wound so it doesn't get infected. And as a bonus point, it's always useful to understand the concept of permissive hypotension. 
Now this is a concept in, in anesthesia, in anesthesiology, where when the patient is asleep, the anesthetists bring the blood pressure right down, the mean arterial pressure right down. This makes the surgery easier for the surgeon who can see what they're doing uh, and also ensures that the patient doesn't lose a lot of blood. And what happens is just as the surgeon is beginning to sort of close up and suture the wounds and so on, what the anesthetist will do is bring the patient back up to normal tension so that any little blood vessels that were kind of um, had stopped bleeding uh, because of the low blood pressure essentially show themselves so that the surgeon can deal with them there and then rather than wait for the blood pressure to go up when the patient is awake which then leads to reactionary bleeding. Hope you find this useful. I'll see you on the next one.